And good evening and welcome to the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Study of the book of Revelation, chapter by chapter. And tonight we're looking at the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation. We would like to welcome all of you that are here and also welcome those that are watching by television or listening on the radio or following on the internet. We are very happy to have you and we hope that this study of the book of Revelation has opened your eyes, helped you to understand where we are in the stream of time, what's happening, what's taking place. And as we finish up, uh, this has been a four-part series and we're down to the fourth part, uh, final events. What happens at the very, very end is what we're looking at. And so we hope that you will follow carefully tonight as we study God's Word. Our subject this evening is God's Last Call. Now, you pick up your Bible, and you'll find that invitation after invitation after invitation has been given by God. You can remember God gave a very, very definite invitation in the days of Noah and invited the people. That was an invitation was given. You also find that God gave a very definite invitation in the days of the Jewish people. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet and gave invitation for the people to follow. Come into the time of the New Testament. Same thing. God gave one invitation after another. Well, tonight, we're down to the last invitation. There won't be another one after this, folks. This is the final one. And so, uh, we hope it will help you understand what's happening because the door of mercy closes in the 18th chapter. That's what happens. And so as we go through it, follow it. Uh, tomorrow, our next presentation we enter into uh, moves on and we get into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Marriage supper of the Lamb. In other words, this controversy is over and God has invited the people to the, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we'll be taking a look at this wonderful wonderful time that God has prepared for his people in the marriage. And so you don't want to miss uh, tomorrow or the next presentation on the marriage supper of the Lamb. It'll be something that I think that'll bless you in a special way. So we're glad you're here, glad that you are able to follow us. Be sure and take your Bible and uh, paper, take notes, follow along as we continue to study God's Word together. Uh, we were blessed the last series that we did here to have with us a quartet. Uh, they came and sang for us and we got so many telephone calls and so many letters of people saying how much they enjoyed the quartet. And, and we just really, we also just enjoyed having them with us very much. And fortunately, we were able to bring them back with us again. And we're sure you're going to enjoy having them here with us uh, for the rest of this week, uh, especially. So we're very happy to have His Voice Quartet. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, tell you where they're from, and what part they sing in the quartet. Hi, my name is Doug Leno, and I'm coming to you from Meridian, Idaho, and I'll be singing bass tonight. My name is Todd Spainhauer, and I'm from Boise, Idaho, and I sing first tenor. And I'm Kevin Spainhauer. I come from Caldwell, Idaho, and I sing second tenor. I'm Harold Dixon. I come from Garden City, Idaho, and I sing baritone. Sounds like we're scattered all over the state, but it's 30 miles from my house to Kevin's, and they're in between. Tonight we want to sing for you when the time comes, uh, a song that expresses our desire to be ready when God gives his last call, ready to walk in Jerusalem, just like John. Great. I'm sure you'll enjoy that. You may have noticed that two of them here 
his names is Spainhauer, and uh, Doug, I think, has some kind of relationship to that also. And uh, of course, one of the things about it is Donna's maiden name was Spainhauer, so it might get you the connection that's involved here. Anyhow, we're very happy that you're here. Before they sing, I'm going to ask Chuck to come out and read with you the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation. Good evening. If you have your Bibles again tonight, we want you to turn to the book of Revelation chapter 18. And we're going to read that together. So if you have your Bibles, turn them to the book of Revelation chapter 18. Let us read together. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen. And has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you should share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. Render her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. And the cup which she mixed, mixed double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and will see no sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judged her. The kings of the earth who committed fornications and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle, sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich in splendor have gone from you. You shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, at last, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their head and cried out, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city, which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you, holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Then the mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down, and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more. And the sound of a millstone shall be not be heard in you any more. The light of the lamp shall not shine in you any more. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her 
was found the blood of the prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. May God add his blessing to his word. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. Oh, John, oh, John, now didn't you say? Walk in Jerusalem just like John. That you'd be there on that great day. Walk in Jerusalem just like John. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. King Jesus Ooh. rides in the middle of the air. Walk in Jerusalem just like John. I pray the Lord will all be there. Walk in Jerusalem just like just like John. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem. Great day, great day, the righteous marching. Great day, walk in Jerusalem just like John. I want to walk in Jerusalem just like John. In Jerusalem just like John. In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, just like John, I want to walk. In Jerusalem, just like John. In Jerusalem, just like John. In Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, just like walk in Jerusalem, just just like John. Father in heaven, tonight, as we approach the end of the book of Revelation, and as we look at the closing events in the history of mankind, we pray that our eyes may be open, that we might be receptive to your word. May the Holy Spirit be here to lead and guide and direct us. May we understand and may we desire that we might do your will and follow you in all that we do. Bless us in our study this evening. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Eighteenth chapter of Revelation opens with this angel that is standing in the sun. And this angel has a message that is so powerful that it illuminates the earth. Listen to what it says about it. After those things I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority and the earth was illuminated with his glory. So this angel speaks with great authority. And what he has to say illuminates the earth. This message that this angel is speaking is what gives impetus to the third angel of Revelation 14. 
It's what causes it to move across the earth with great power and brings what the scripture refers to as the loud cry or the latter rain. This is what brings it about is this angel's message. And this third angel in Revelation, the 14th chapter, had this to say. Then the third angel followed them, saying what? With what? With a loud voice. In other words, it's being proclaimed across the whole earth with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. So this third angel is proclaiming a message across the earth telling the people to refrain from receiving the mark of the beast. And this angel of Revelation 18 adds emphasis to that and it's proclaimed across the earth. So this that we're looking at tonight basically is the last invitation that God has given to mankind. It's the very last one. There won't be another one. It's the last invitation that he's given to mankind. Years ago, a lady by the name of Ellen G. White made a statement about people that had written her. I want you to listen to what she said. Several had written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message and I have answered it as the third angel's message in verity. Now the third angel's message is that you and I should not receive the mark of the beast. That's what the message is. And she said this is the third angel's message in verity. So what did she mean when she is saying this is the third angel's message in verity? What is the message of righteousness by faith. When we talk about righteousness by faith, what's, what's involved in that? What do we mean if the third angel's message is that and the people are asked to follow the Lord and to walk with him and that we're to have righteousness by faith? Well, I'd like to define what righteousness by faith is. To begin, righteousness by faith is yielding the will to the will of God. Now let me say that again. Righteousness by faith is yielding the will to the will of God. I must, if I'm going to walk by righteousness by faith, if I'm going to walk by faith, I must surrender my will to his will. It won't work any other way. Okay? Secondly, it's rendering obedience to his commandments. In other words, if I'm going to yield my will to his will, then I must be obedient to God's commandments. If God says, this is the way, then I must walk in that. And, and, and I can't do it as I think I should. I have to do it as I understand he wants it done. And thirdly, it's making his standard of righteousness the aim of our lives. In other words, his standard of righteousness must be the aim of my life. That is righteousness by faith. But you say that's a pretty tall order. Sure it is. It has to be. It wouldn't be if it wasn't to call you and I to step up, to follow him, to accept by faith what he's willing to do for us. So what does that mean when it says righteous in my faith? What is faith? What is faith? 
Well, faith is really quite simple. Faith is simply trusting in God. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. David could say, in God I put my trust. In other words, if righteousness by faith is going to work in my life, then I must be yielded to His will, and I must trust Him to do whatever He wants to do with me. Completely. I must learn total and complete dependence upon Him. Only when I come to the place that I understand that, then does it begin to work in my life. Abraham of old, it says, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted to him for righteousness. What did he believe in the Lord about? What did he believe? Well, he believed one thing, that God had promised him an heir. And uh, humanly impossible. It couldn't be done because it says very clearly that Sarah had never been able to have a child. It even says she was past that time of life. And if you read Romans, it tells you that Abraham was beyond that time. So humanly impossible to have a child, but God promised him one. Also took him and put him in the land of Canaan that was hostile to him and said, I'm going to give you this land. And he believed God, believed what the Lord said, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So with me and with you, when God says, this is what you should do, then I must believe him and follow when it comes to questions of faith. Faith is the vehicle by which you lay hold of what Christ has done for you. That's faith. When it's the vehicle by which I lay hold of what God has done for me. In other words, if I understand the book right, and I hope and pray by grace that I understand what God is saying, that my righteousness won't count. But I understand that Christ's righteousness does count. And that I can only have his righteousness by faith. I can't get it any other way. I can't say, well, I'll do this and this and this. No. It's given totally and completely on faith. That's the way it comes. All right. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. That commandment is intricately tied up in the question of the mark of the beast. Why? Well, it says all that do not have the mark should be killed. Well, did you ever think about it? Why would that particular commandment be intricately tied up in that question? Well, if I believe something, and it's totally in my head what I believe, you can't do much about that. You don't know what's going on up here. So you can't do much about that. But if what I believe affects my lifestyle, you can do something about that. You can pass legislation that affects that, my lifestyle. This is where the Sabbath comes in. The problem is, is that Sabbath commandment, that fourth commandment, 
is the only one of the commandments that tells you who the true God is. It's the only, only one of the ten that tells you who the true God is. See, I could take this altar here and make it my God. People do that to this day. And I could say, my God says I'm not to take his name in vain. Uh, my God says that I'm not to have any other gods before him. Uh, my God says I'm to honor my father and my mother. My God says I should not kill. I can take all nine of those commandments and apply it to that. But when I come to the fourth one, it won't fit. Because it says that he created heaven and earth. That leaves out anything that man has made. You see, so that commandment becomes very, very important. And if I take anything, listen to me carefully, folks. If I take anything else and I put it in place of what God has given, that is righteousness by works. Righteousness by faith is only when you accept what God has given. It's the only way it fits. No other way. Okay, let's go on and let's take a look at what happens here now. <clears throat> it says in this angel, and he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. So this angel is proclaiming that Babylon has fallen. Please notice there is a great difference between when she has fallen and when she's destroyed. Because she can fall in the eyes of God and not in the eyes of man. And when it's saying here, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, it's talking about her falling in the eyes of God. She's not following what he says. For all nations have what? Drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. In other words, Babylon has come forth and through what she has done, the whole world and all the merchants of the earth and all have become wealthy through what she has done. In other words, Babylon has been well received by the world. But she has fallen in the eyes of God. And simply what it's saying here. It says they have become drunk. And I told you about this. You know, it's very, very difficult to reason with a drunk. I can remember when I was a young pastor, we were holding some meetings. Another fellow and I, we were working on things for the meeting, pitching a tent and so forth. And in the town was a, uh, a drunk. He was drunk all the time. And we decided that we were going to help him and convert him, see. And so we hired him to work, work with us. And uh, being a young pastor... And not very smart. Uh, he worked, worked for us for several days. And then I didn't have enough sense not to pay him. And I paid him. And you know what he did. He took the money and went and got drunk. And I can remember uh, we went looking for him and finally found him. But we couldn't reason with him. We couldn't get him to do anything. But he came to the meeting that night. And uh, sitting there in the meeting, and I'm preaching. And he gets up and starts down the aisle, saying, Eve came from an apple. Eve came from an apple. And we all called him Moose. And I said, Moose, sit down and be quiet. And he sat down in one of the chairs and didn't say any more. But you, you just can't reason with a drunk. 
So understand, these people are drunk with the wine of her fornication. That's what they're drunk with. What is that? This woman, this harlot, Babylon, what is that she's made the world drunk with her wine? Well, you have three things here. I talked about them last night. Babylon is made up of three things. It's made up of paganism, and it's made up of Protestantism, and it's made up of Catholicism. Those are the three, because you have three characters involved. You have a dragon, which represents paganism. You have a beast, which represents Catholicism. And you have the false prophet, which represents Protestantism. And this is a mixture of all that put together, and that makes what the Scripture refers to as Babylon. And they have become, the inhabitants of the earth have become drunk through what she teaches, such as the immortality of the soul that comes straight from paganism. This is where it comes from. And it was given to the Catholic Church and then from the Catholic Church to Protestantism. And so today the whole world is full of the idea that man does not die, that he goes off to another place. But this is not what the book teaches, folks. There is no foundation for that in the Word of God. Or you can take the belief of the false Sabbath, Sunday worship, not based on Scripture, came directly from paganism and passed on to these others. And this becomes the belief and what the Scripture refers to as Babylon. And the world is drunk with the wine of her fornication. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Please notice, God is saying very clearly that he has his people in Babylon. That's why I'm telling you that at this point, the door of mercy is not closed. Tonight, the door of mercy is not closed. Tonight, it's open. And a person can come to God and I can give him my heart and I can surrender my life to him and I can commit my life to him and the door of mercy is open and I can receive mercy. But the day is coming and we're going to see it in this chapter in which that door closes. And when that door closes, there will be no more opportunity to come to God. But right now he says, call in my people to come out of her, come out of Babylon don't continue to live in Babylon. That's the invitation God's given. Now, what's the problem here? Babylon. Let me tell you about Babylon. Things are good in Babylon. They have lived in luxury on the earth. I mean, things are nice in Babylon. Go back to Babylon of old. And the Jewish people were carried off to Babylon. Don't think that when they were carried off to Babylon and lived in Babylon that they had it rough. They didn't. Have you forgotten? Daniel was the prime minister of the country. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego held very, very high offices. I mean, they were treated great. They had nice homes. They had good jobs. Things were good in Babylon. It wasn't hard. It was good there. In fact, it was so good that after 70 years in Babylon, and God said the time has come to go back to Jerusalem, this is what happened. Ezra decided to take a group back to Jerusalem. Listen to what happened here. Now I gathered them by the river that flows from Ahava, and we camped there three days. And I looked among the people and the priest and found none of the sons of Levi there. I mean, they, he said, we're going to take a group back to Jerusalem, live there. Not one of the tribe of Levi showed up. Not one. 
They all had it nice in Babylon. Right there. Stayed there. In fact, he had to go back and make another appeal before he got some of them to go with him back to Jerusalem. Why not go back to Jerusalem? Well, because things aren't very nice in Jerusalem. There's no jobs in Jerusalem. The city's in ruins. Things are not good there at all. It's rough. It's hard. Get the picture. In the last days, it's not going to be good among God's people. It's going to be good in Babylon. And you have to make a decision whether you're going to come out of Babylon and be on God's side or whether you're going to go along with Babylon. That decision has to be made which way you're going to go. And so, he's saying, come out of her, my people, that you do not receive her plagues. This is, this is God's last call. I'm sorry, folks, there's not another one. When we come to there, that will be it. There won't be another time Another place in which God's going to invite. It will be over. Watch what happens from this point on. The door of mercy at this point is open. You can come to God. You can accept him. You can follow him. But the door of mercy now is open. But starting at this point, the door closes. For her sins have reached to heaven. God has remembered her iniquities. The cup is full. Her sins have reached to heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. When? When do her sins reach heaven? When does that happen? When it says her sins have reached to heaven and God remembers her iniquities. When does that take place? Well, that takes place when this happens. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. When that decree is made... That those who do not have the mark of the beast, those who do not worship the image of the beast, should be killed. He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Said he would cause all. It means speak, means to legislate. Cause means to enforce. And so when... Mankind enforces those to follow the beast and to follow what the beast says. Dear friend, that is when her sins have reached unto heaven. And that is when, I'm sorry, but the door of mercy closes. That's when it happens. So Babylon, who has... Taking a position against God. The time has come for the door to close. Paganism, Protestantism, Catholicism. Paganism has always been uh, basically counter to what God has taught. I mean, all the way through the Bible, you find that paganism has always taught different than what the scripture taught. Catholicism, God in his mercy and in his kindness pled with her for years to change. 
wouldn't. And so you have, because she would not change growing out of that, the Reformation. And you found that great men, such as Knox and Calvin and Luther and Zwingli, and all those great reformers that stood up and took the Word of God and built their belief on the Word of God and said, this is where we stand. And out of that, the great Protestant movement was born. And even when the pilgrims came over to the United States, and as they were getting on the ship, their pastor Robinson stood there and talked with them, and he urged them that when they got to the new world, that they would follow the Word of God. And then he said something. He said to them, As you understand what the Scripture teaches, walk in the light of it. But unfortunately, Protestantism did not continue to walk in the light that God gave them. And they have given up what they stood for, and today there's no conviction there of what God's Word says and to follow what the Word says. And so you have the uniting now of those powers bringing together what the Scripture classifies as Babylon. They unite on the worship of of a day that God never gave. They believe beliefs that the Scripture does not teach. They turn away from that of the Sabbath and refuse to follow what God says about the Sabbath. And for those reasons, her cup is full. So he says this to her. Render to her just as she rendered to you. And repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. He said, give back to her double of what she gave. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow, for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and I will not see sorrow. Now, folks, you've got to understand, the Bible teaches clearly that there is a period of time in which Babylon will sit as a queen. And it will be great. And things will be wonderful. And they will, the whole world will wander after her and follow what she has put off, so much so that it says they are drunk by the wine of her fornication. So that you can't, you, there's going to be a time in which this will be very, very good. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. He said she's lived luxuriously. She has not followed what God's word says. Therefore give to her double of what she has given. And dear friends, the seven last plagues will be double of anything that she has ever had. Probation for the human race will have closed. Those words in Revelation where it says, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be right holy still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. Those words are pronounced and probation closes for mankind. And as probation closes, then these things that they have had and lived so luxuriously with all come to an end. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day. Now, as I told you, some people take those things and would like to apply that as 15 days 
uh, or at one day, one year, I should say, or at one hour, they apply as 15 days. I don't know. I would say it refers more to a short period of time. But her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. I mean, he's going to pour out his wrath upon her. And the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. They're going to see Babylon and all that she stood for crumbling. Now, folks, these put together what you heard previous last night where these ten kings and the beast and the false prophet all accept her and follow her and they're all in agreement with her, but now all the things that she has said is crumbling, coming down. And they stand back and they weep, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for one, in one hour your judgment has come. I mean, it has moved swiftly upon them. The ten horns, which you saw on the beast, these will what? Hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. You see, they are the ones that will turn against her. Like I told you, it says those ten kings gave their authority to the beast. You don't find them giving it to the woman. They gave it to the beast. And so those ten kings, the beast, the false prophet, all turn against the woman. Make her desolate and naked. Eat her flesh. Burn her with fire. You have complete financial collapse taking place here. That's what's pictured in the 18th chapter. is financial collapse of everything around. Watch. Watch. As he talks about the merchants. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. No one buys their merchandise anymore. I mean, they have had it good. They've lived luxuriously. Things have gone well. But now, all of a sudden, it's come crashing down. And no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver Precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, all the things that man has made and that man sells and trades for back and forth, all that ceases to be worth anything. All your gold, all your silver will be worth nothing. What is gold worth? Or what is silver worth if it won't buy anything? If you can't buy anything with it, what's it worth? Reminds me when I've gone over to Israel. And you get off the plane or you get out there and go through the cities. And these little kids come up. Always asking for a dollar. You know. And I've reached in my pocket and pulled out some change and handed them change. And they just throw it on the ground. Because it's not worth anything. Not worth anything. Just throw it on the ground. They'll take the gold. Throw it on the ground. It won't be worth a thing, folks. It's all come to an end. The cinnamon and incense, fragrant oils, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses and chariots and bodies and the souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. 
All the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you find them no more at all. I mean, financial collapse has taken place. None of it to be worth anything. The merchants of these things who became what? They became rich by her, will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. Those that accepted her with arms, praised her greatness now, are going to stand back and they're going to mourn and weep because she's come to the end, saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, merchandise, is not worth a thing. Not only, folks, not only is the merchandise not worth anything, but world trade will come to an end. I mean, today we live in a time where you can trade all over the world. I mean, you can go home, sit down at your computer, and you can buy anything in Japan, Germany, France, all anywhere in the world. You can shop. But that all comes to an end. Listen. For in one hour, her great riches came to nothing. Listen. Every shipmaster, all who traveled by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the seas, stood a distance. That's world trade. And cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? What's like Babylon, this great city? All the things that we experienced. They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, the great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. The great controversy has come to an end. Babylon has fallen. It's over. Rejoice over her, O heavens, and you holy apostles and prophets. For God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with great violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flutists and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman nor any craft shall be found in you anymore. The sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchant, the merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who were slain on the earth. You see, dear friend, what it's simply telling us? That time is short. You and I have time right now. But it's run out. When we hit this time, it's over. There's no more time. Because when we take a look at the 19th chapter... The first verse says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation, glory, and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. You see, God's kingdom has come into being. We're going to take a look at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's come down to the end. The controversy is over. God has brought it to an end. Dear friend, you and I need to make absolutely sure that we're walking by faith, following Him, obeying Him, that our wills are surrendered to His will, that we will follow the Word of God. May God bless you as you continue to study the Word of God. In the heart of Southern Illinois lies a small town named after A.J. Nason who came in 1923 with plans for a dream city and the largest coal mine in the United States. Surveyors laid out the streets and the sidewalks and workers built the tallest smoke stack in the country, complete with a Spanish turret and decorative cathedral doors at the top. Railroad tracks were laid, 
And as the word of this dream city spread, people flocked in by the thousands. But as the black coal came out of those deep tunnels, miners came closer and closer to the end of the dream. And after just three years of mining, an underground river flooded the shaft. Suddenly, the operations became very costly. And although Mr. Nason poured millions into his mine, eventually it was taken over by the bank. People left the city in droves. Some didn't even bother to take their furniture. Soon the tracks lay dormant. Weeds grew up around the beautiful train station and abandoned homes gave way to trees. Today, locals say that Nason is the only town in America where you can hunt quail from the sidewalk. Although other coal companies tried to revive it, Nason's mine never again turned a profit, and today only a few hundred people are left. Mr. Nason's dream went up in smoke. All that remains is a beautiful smokestack, an old train station, and miles of deserted tracks. The Bible says earthly treasures are easily stolen by thieves and destroyed by moth and rust. But our Heavenly Father is building a dream city with streets of gold and mansions by a crystal sea. He invites us to come live with Him for eternity and never grow old. The Bible also says that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And in this day and age, when stocks lose their value in minutes and entire banking systems fail, God invites us to put our treasures in things of eternal value. Friends, nothing is more valuable than a human soul. Won't you help us bring the good news of salvation to those who are lost? Please, ask the Holy Spirit what He would have you do. Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, Please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll-free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the series The Final Events may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven-part series including The Scarlet Beast, Ten Kings, God's Last Call, Marriage Supper of the Lamb, Millennium, The New Jerusalem, and The Victory is Won may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors. In the heart of Southern Illinois lies a small town named after A.J. Nason, who came in 1923 with plans for a dream city and the largest coal mine in the United States. Surveyors laid out the streets and the sidewalks, and workers built the tallest smoke stack in the country complete with a Spanish turret and decorative cathedral doors at the top. Railroad tracks were laid, and as the word of this dream city spread, people flocked in by the thousands. But as the black coal came out of those deep tunnels, 
miners came closer and closer to the end of the dream. And after just three years of mining, an underground river flooded the shaft. Suddenly, the operations became very costly. And although Mr. Nason poured millions into his mine, eventually it was taken over by the bank. People left the city in droves. Some didn't even bother to take their furniture. Soon the tracks lay dormant. Weeds grew up around the beautiful train station and abandoned homes gave way to trees. Today, locals say that Nason is the only town in America where you can hunt quail from the sidewalk. Although other coal companies tried to revive it, Nason's mine never again turned a profit and today only a few hundred people are left. Mr. Nason's dream went up in smoke. All that remains is a beautiful smokestack, an old train station, and miles of deserted tracks. The Bible says earthly treasures are easily stolen by thieves and destroyed by moth and rust. But our Heavenly Father is building a dream city with streets of gold and mansions by a crystal sea. He invites us to come live with Him for eternity and never grow old. The Bible also says that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And in this day and age, when stocks lose their value in minutes and entire banking systems fail, God invites us to put our treasures in things of eternal value. Friends, nothing is more valuable than a human soul. Won't you help us bring the good news of salvation to those who are lost? Please, ask the Holy Spirit what He would have you do. Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll-free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the series The Final Events may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven-part series including The Scarlet Beast, Ten Kings, God's Last Call, Marriage Supper of the Lamb, Millennium, The New Jerusalem, and The Victory is Won may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.